A pioneer at the conductor's podium, Maranao Sop directs a clutch of world-renowned orchestras, weighs in as musical director in art centres near and far, and tirelessly promotes new talent through fellowships and competitions. She's currently in France to judge a contest open to young women conductors from around the world, and we're lucky enough to have her in the studio too. Maranao Sop, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Great to be here. Now, as I mentioned, you're on the jury of La Maestra. That's a contest launched this year by the Paris Mozart Orchestra and the Philharmonic. The award involves a series of tests with progressive heats, and it sounds like the sort of prestigious, rigorous selection protests that, you know, actually reveals the highest level of talent and dedication in classical music. I would imagine that's unrelated to gender. So there must have been a real need to make this competition exclusively female. Well, I think, uh, you know, the the landscape is changing quite dramatically these days, but the opportunities for women are still f much fewer and much further between. And as a conductor, you don't have an instrument unless you have an opportunity in front of an orchestra. You can't practice at home. I mean, you can, but it's not the same at all. So it's really critical that women get given opportunities, and particularly opportunities that have... Um, growth potential, where they get feedback, where they can improve, these kinds of things. And this competition, it's not just a competition. It's, a, it's really about a long cycle of assisting these talented women in their career development. Now, for those of us who find conducting to be a bit of a mysterious art, what are you looking for when you're judging these women? What makes an excellent conductor? I think the qualities that make an excellent conductor are the same qualities that make an excellent leader. You know, you're looking for someone that connects, um, someone that can galvanize people, inspire them, um, motivate them, bring out the best in them. And of course, then if we're looking for expertise, musical expertise, a great ear, good inner rhythm, um, good gesture uh, language. So I, it's a it's quite a tall order, I have to say. Yeah. There's an ensemble of skills there, yes. indeed. Well, let's take a look at one of those excellent conductors in action. Maybe we'll even pick up some tips. Here's Marin Alsop <laughs> directing at the Philharmonic in Paris just last week. Now, there seems to be a wonderful symmetry here because I believe you yourself won a prize at the Leopold Stokowski International Conducting Competition, which sort of went on to launch your career and you've been an important mentor for the younger generation. So when you were starting out, did you have a mentor, someone you looked up to? Well, the reason I wanted to become a conductor was because I saw Leonard Bernstein conduct when I was nine. Okay. And as soon as I saw him, I said, oh, this is what I want to do. And my parents were both professional musicians, so they were very supportive of that. Um, and uh, Bernstein eventually became my teacher and, and a very, very close friend and, and, my, and my mentor. And I think it's really, really, really critical um, in every walk of life that people have mentors. You know, it's amazing what a small phrase or a small idea can do for, for someone, you know, on their career path. So I, I'm a great believer in trying to give back as much as possible. Okay. Now, in the course of your career, I wasn't d surprised at all to discover that you'd won a MacArthur Fellowship, which is unofficially known as the Genius Grant, which celebrates and facilitates work in many fields. What I was surprised to discover was that you were the first conductor to receive that award. Why do you think that is? Are conductors less visible in the arts somehow? I think that uh, traditionally conductors have uh, have really focused on on their skill set and what they're doing. And I see conducting more as a vehicle um, for social change, for um, really advancing art so that it becomes accessible and available to everyone. So I think perhaps I just have taken it one step further. Okay. Now, when you became principal conductor at the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra in 2007, you were the first woman to hold a major conducting post in America. That's what seems quite late. 
But then I discovered that here in France, no state-funded orchestra has a permanent female conductor. And in the UK, there's only one. I'm sure this is a common question for you, but what can we put this absence down to? I think, again, it's, it's not having access and not having opportunity. Um, it's certainly not about talent. There are incredibly talented women out there. But, you know, we have to... Once people are used to seeing always a man in a role or always a woman in this role or always something, it takes a long time for society to adjust. And I think a competition like La Maestra or a fellowship like I have, uh, the Taki Fellowship, they really change the landscape for the future because people start seeing women that don't all look the same. You know, and then we can really change things, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, gender equality when it comes to pay and conditions is one of the battles being fought in the classical music sector at the moment, along with the issue of sexual harassment and a so-called culture of silence in the industry. It's even spawned its own hashtag, Music2. Now, a couple of French classical musicians have recently spoken out about their experiences decrying sexist and inappropriate behaviour. Let's hear from them. The classical music industry is an industry that has not escaped the current issues, such as sexism, the lack of equal opportunities, misogyny and sexual harassment. So, of course, when you're a woman, it is something that impacts us more. We have experienced all of this, and so I think that all women in the music industry have to fight a bit more to have the same opportunities as men. We know it is something we need to continue fighting for. So Julie and Camille Bertolo, uh, Bertolet sorry, are suggesting that the fight must continue there. But for some in the industry, I think that fight has only really just begun. Do you agree that this is one of the sectors where a so-called culture of silence has per perhaps delayed things, slowed things down? Well, I certainly think that the entertainment industry as a whole, and I would put music in, mm. in, in, into that same basket, I think that it really has lent itself the, to this kind of abuse um, for women. And... I'm thrilled that to see young women feeling confident to speak out about it. I think this is a great sign for possibility in the future. Mm, for change, indeed. Now, not only were you the first woman to conduct a major orchestra in the US, another first, you were the, also the first woman to conduct at the last night of the proms in the UK. Now, that's a hugely popular event, as you know, established at the end of the 19th century. Let's get a taste of Marin's work there at the Royal Albert Hall in 2013. Here's Leonard Bernstein's Chichester Psalms, performed by the BBC Symphony Orchestra and its chorus, directed by Marin Alsop. Now, they've just staged an audience-free version of the proms in London due to the coronavirus pandemic. And there was another issue in the run-up to that event which dominated the debate. Some people took issue with the songs Rule Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory, which are traditionally sung there. These songs are seen as problematic by some due to their links to the empire, its association with uh, the exploitation of slaves in the colonies. And then on the other side, there were people saying, well, if the BBC cancels them, what does this mean about censorship? Do you think that the arts are the sort of place to have these social and political debates? Well, I think it's important to have this discussion and have an open discussion. Of course, in the United States, we've been going through this recently with all the statues coming down and, you know, finally, after so many years. And to me, it's not what it's not really the issue. It's having an open discussion. And I think um, racism and I think inequality are huge issues for our time. And we all need to participate in talking about them. In whatever uh, domain that is. Whether Absolutely. It's the arts. Yeah, indeed. Now, finally, we asked you for a cultural tip uh, to let us know what we should be seeing, reading or listening to. And you pointed us in the direction of a TV series, Lovecraft Country. What is it about that one that we should be checking out? Well, this is a fascinating new sort of 
cross between sci-fi and uh, I don't know. It's a it, it's a really interesting series, and my good friend Laura Cartman is writing all the music, and we have an orchestra that's recording it virtually from their homes. Um, so the music is fabulous, but the t it's very topical because it it really it really turns the black white um, uh, sort of what we're used to on its head. And this is a very important, I think, um, issue for us to think about these days. Oh, plenty of social and political and cultural material there exactly. as well. Exactly. Also some sci-fi. <laughs> Which <laughs> is never unwelcome. <laughs> thank you so much for the tip and thanks for joining us today. Oh, Marinelle. my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now we'll leave you with a clip of Lovecraft Country. Do remember you can get more arts and culture on our website and our social media channels too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. I'm doing this to protect us. You can't win this game. They're setting up for you to play. This legacy belongs to our family. We gotta face this new world. Instinct, I'll claim it. This is our family story.